بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Let me start by saying that we as a Muslim Ummah are bound by one destiny. Our aspirations are the same. Our issues, concerns, and grievances are connected. And it is imperative for every one of us here to understand that one wound, one injury in the body of the Muslim Ummah does not negate the other wound and the other injury. Because again, we are bound by the same destiny and this is a one body and until we rebalance this ummah and readjust our ummah by addressing all of these issues we will not be able to redefine our role in this life and we will not be able to win any battle against oppression or occupation in the Arab and in the Muslim world now, of course, I'm not going to be talking about all of the, the wounds in the body of the Muslim Ummah. There are so many issues. In fact, the previous speaker, our brother from Syria, just told us about the devastation that is taking place in Syria and the aspiration of the Syrian people to fight oppression. And inshallah, eventually, we will defeat oppression, not only in Syria, but in Egypt, in Palestine, in Libya, in Yemen, in Bangladesh, in Kashmir, in many parts of the Muslim world, because oppression is an inhumane act that is being, that is, that is being directed against us as human beings. Forget that we're Arabs and Muslims. Remember that we're human beings and we deserve to live in freedom and in dignity. That's an inherited right, a right that was given to all of us by Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, as I said, there is no time to go through all of these issues. In fact, I don't have a lot of time to go through all of the aspects of the Palestinian question. There are so many things to be addressed and there are so many issues that needs to be discussed. We don't have time for that. But what I'll do is I will start by from the point of, from last week, in fact, when the recent US UN Security Council resolution was passed, the resolution 2334, that condemned the Israeli settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, that called on Israel to immediately and completely seize any building of settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and that deemed all of these settlements since 1967, since June 4th, 1967, when Israel occupied the rest of Palestine, the West Bank, Gaza, deemed them as illegal, and in fact, it refers to them as a flagrant violation of international law. And it also re concludes that the expansion of settlements and the continuation of building these settlements is hindering the possibility of having a two-state solution. Now, whether you believe in a two-state solution or not, that's another issue. But in fact, there is no possibility now to create a two-state solution since 60% of the West Bank now is under Israel control. 60% of the West Bank is being designated for settlement building and settlement expansion. So they leave you with 40% and the 40% are not connected. The 40% is not contiguous. The 40% are more of cantons where the Palestinians are being concentrated in a form like what existed in South Africa under the apartheid system. So in reality, there is no possibility for a two-state solution, even if the Palestinians will accept it, even if Israel will accept the notion, as Netanyahu claimed in 2012, that he accepts a Palestinian state or the right of the Palestinians to have a Palestinian state, but they left them no place, no, no area, no territory to have a Palestinian state. Now, this resolution just came out. It condemned these settlements. Now, everyone knows that the United States 
abstained from voting. That's why Secretary Kerry just finished his speech, where he addressed the Israeli charges that were leveled against the Obama administration. And he laid out, I was reading the news, it's just finished, so I, I was reading the news now, I, I didn't get the chance to hear his speech. But he laid out some of the parameters that needs to exist to have a Palestinian state or to allow enough space to create a Palestinian state where you will end with a two-state solution. But this resolution was voted for in favor by 14 states. The only abstention was the United States, which usually vetoes such resolutions. This resolution is not binding, is non-binding because it's under Chapter 6 of the UN Charter, not under Chapter 7. Of course, it's known why. The U.S. would have not allowed it to be voted on or even to be brought to a vote had it not, you know, been under the Chapter 6, where Israel still enjoys this impunity, where Israel does not get punished for its actions and its crimes that are committed against the Palestinian people and against the international law and international norms. Also, this resolution, just to be clear, does not address all of our rights and the plight of the Palestinian people. It does not address the fact that Israel was founded by way of war crimes against humanity. And for those who are taking notes as usual, will go and review what Benny Morris, an Israeli historian, a very famous historian, said about the creation of the State of Israel and how was Israel created by way of force, by way of expulsion, by way of rape and massacres. That's what he has in his book, The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem, rev revised in 2004. So Israel was created upon or by war crimes against, hum against Palestinians. This is not addressed in the resolution. Also, what is not addressed is the fact that the Palestinians are being dispossessed from their own land. The Palestinians are banned from going back home. They cannot claim the sense of belonging. They cannot claim their roots in Palestine. We're banned from saying that and doing that. So yes, the resolution doesn't go far enough. But that doesn't mean that it is not an important resolution. Because this resolution does tackle the root cause of the problem, and that is Israel, the Israeli policies. Yes, it doesn't say that the creation of Israel is the problem, but what it says, on the ashes of the Palestinian people, definitely, but what it says that the Israeli policies, since June 4th, 1967, are the main reason for instability in the occupied Palestine. It is the main reason for instability. This is a fact. This is a fact. Yes, it doesn't go enough, but it is a fact. So don't underestimate the impact of this resolution. Not only that, it also makes clear that every single settlement that was built after June 4th, 1967, as illegal. And it declares if the whole territory that was occupied after 1967 as an occupied territory, while Israel claims that the land that was occupied after June 4th, 1967 as a disputed territory. Now we have a resolution, yes, not non-binding, but now it defines what the occupied territory is, and that is the entire land of 1967. That's one thing. The other thing is that it's very obvious now that the world is sick and tired of the Israeli policies. Even the United States that always shielded Israel from criticism, that shielded Israel from the international law and the international norms, that shielded Israel from uh, being punished for its criminal acts, even the United States couldn't take it anymore. Some might say this is because President Obama is not a good friend of, of, of Netanyahu. 
Well, that is a reason, yes. But remember, Reagan wasn't very happy with Israel. George Bush, the father, wasn't very happy with Israel. Bill Clinton wasn't very happy with Israel. George Bush, the son, wasn't very happy with Israel. Now, the way Obama expressed his, his frustration is different maybe from the previous presidents, with the exception of George Bush, the father, who threatened to withhold the loan guarantees to Israel to force Israel to participate in the uh, International Peace Conference in 1991. But still, this is a culmination of the frustration that the world is feeling about Israel. Israel is defying the, all of the international laws, all of the international resolutions, and it is time for Israel to hear it from the world. So yes, the resolution doesn't go far enough, but again, it sends a powerful message to Israel. Also, some might say this is only a symbolic victory, a symbolic moral victory for the Palestinians. Well, I agree with that since it's non-binding again. But remember, if we have the right Palestinian leadership, this resolution could help us bring Israel before the International Criminal Court. But I'm very doubtful under the current Palestinian leadership and the structure of the current Palestinian leadership. So it's not about Mahmoud Abbas Abu Mazen. It is about the entire structure of the Palestinian official leadership which is not a legitimate leadership of, the, leadership of the Palestinian people. That's one thing. But if the Palestinian leadership will not take advantage of this resolution, this resolution serves another purpose for the proponents of the Palestinian cause. And that is, it gives more legitimacy now to the PDS movement worldwide. Because now you have an international resolution that says the Israeli policies since June 4, 1967 are detrimental to peace and detrimental to stability. So do not undermine or underestimate the power of this resolution. But I don't think this is the only reasons why this resolution is very serious and will have, potentially could have serious um, consequences for Israel. There are other reasons. There are other reasons. And the major reason is, is that the US and Israel now are not on the same page. Because Israel was never a true friend of Israel. Uh, Israel was never a true friend of the United States. Let me refresh your memory. We have the Israeli Prime Minister now, accusing our president here of stabbing back Israel, stabbing Israel in the back, calling the abstention as a shameless act or ambush, and other officials calling this as a shameful move. These officials, the Israeli officials, have no gratitude, have no appreciation to the administration that not only shielded them, that not only accepted their conditions to the so-called peace, when it, especially when it comes to the Jewishness of the state of Israel or the, character Jewish, uh, the Jewish character of the state of Israel, and that accepted that the major blocks of the Israeli settlements to, to, and in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem to continue to be under, the Israeli, uh, under Israel's control and to be annexed by Israel, and that accepted the Israeli position that East Jerusalem is a disputed territory and not an occupied territory. This administration that not only did that for Israel, but also gave more money, more financial aid, and more military aid to Israel than any other pre previous administration, is being accused by this government of Israel and the Israeli firsters in the United States and the, Isra the, the Israeli apologists in the United States and those the Zionist figures who hold an American passport and American citizenship but who suffer from a syndrome called double loyalty where they put the Israeli agenda, the Israeli interests ahead of the American agenda. It did expose them now. Remember, this is the administration that helped Israel develop the Iron Dome. 
Remember that this is the administration that increased the financial, the military financial aid to Israel from 3.1 billion dollars a year to 3.8 billion dollars a year, 38 billion dollars over the next 10 fiscal years, coming years. Still, this administration is being accused by these clans as anti-Jews and anti-Semites. In fact, Morton Klein, the head of the organization, the Zionist Organization of America, who holds an American passport, who holds an American citizenship, calls the president of the United States as a Jew, a, a, a Jew hearing, and call him as an anti-Semite. That's what they call the president who gave everything for Israel. Just because this administration dared to say enough is enough. As Kerry just explained, it's not because the U.S. is abandoning Israel, rather because Israel is doing everything wrong when it, when it comes to its own security and when it, to its own interests. So the prism in which you know, the administration is, is embarking from is that they are worrying about Israel more than anything else. They think that the, 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 fr the time frame for a two-state solution is about to close, it's about to go, and they think that this will force Israel to accept a one state, and the U.S. Say, is saying to Israel, it is not in your best interest to have a one-state solution or a binational state, which Israel is vehemently opposed to, and they're telling them, if you continue on this course, building settlements and expanding settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, you will end up with a one-state solution. So they are doing it for their own good. Still, they have the audacity to call the president a Jew hearing and an anti-Semite. So if it tells us anything that these Israeli firsters who put Israel ahead of the United States and the interests of the United States are exposed now here in the United States. And we should capitalize on that. Because we truly believe that we're not trying to impose our agenda and our narrative on our foreign policy. Yes, we don't like our foreign policy when it comes uh, to the Middle East. Yes, we're not very happy with the way this foreign policy is conducted. Yes, maybe we don't agree with the the, the foundation of the foreign policy and the way it's approaching our issues. But what we're not saying that we are anti-American, Americanism. We're not saying that we want America to shift, radically shift. We understand our capacity and we understand how far we can go and we understand that the United States cannot be but pro-Israel. We understand it. But what we're asking the, the U.S. is to have a more balanced and more fair approach to the Middle East. That's what we're asking. We're not asking for a pure, just approach because we know it's impossible. Still, the Israelis and the Israeli firsters will not accept that, although it is detrimental to the American national interest. Now, my, some might say this is Osama Burshid is making this conclusion. In fact, it is David Petraeus, when he was the head of the Central Command in 2010, when he testified before the Senate Committee on Armed Services that the Israeli policies in the region are undermining the American national interest and the American national security. So I think it is time for us to seize on this opportunity and to understand that what the Obama administration did is not merely a reflection of what this president believes. Rather, it is a reflection of a shift in the American public opinion. It is a slow, it is a slow shift. It is a slow shift. But you will, if you will follow the, if you follow the polls, you will find that there is a, a real shift within the Democratic Party. There is a real shift among the millennials. There is a real shift among the African Americans. There is a real shift among the Hispanic. And there is a real shift among the, the younger gener Jewish generation in this country. The polls and the numbers do reflect this, these facts. And they see this and they understand this. And Bernie Sanders wasn't an individual. He represented a movement. And for those who will say everything will change after January, tw January 20th, as Trump himself tweeted, well, yes, it could change 
on the official level. But it, will not, it, not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will change on the popular level. Maybe we'll have a harder time dealing with the Trump administration. A man who has expressed willingness to move the, the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, a man whose choice for ambas uh, the ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, who's a diehard Zionist, puts the Israeli agenda and the Israeli interest ahead of the, of the American agenda. So yes, we could have a change when it comes to the administration and to the official position, but that doesn't mean that we're losing the public opinion battle. Yes, the majority, the overwhelming majority are still pro-Israel, but they're not pro-Israel because they're wicked. They're not pro-Israel because they hate the Palestinians. They're pro-Israel because the Israeli lobby is doing its job here in the United States, because they're doing their homework, because they're spending money and they're exerting efforts to, con to, con to keep Israel as the, untouch the untouchable issue here in the United States, the sacred cow. But the reality is, is, the Isra is that Israel is becoming a partisan issue. It is no longer a nonpartisan issue. We are seeing the trends. So my call to every one of us here, my plea to all of us, is that we need to continue to work for Palestine. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up on Palestine. Don't give up on the United States because we're part of this country. We're not going to accept to be called on Americans. We're not going to accept to be discriminated against by an ideology that espouses hatred and discrimination. We're not going to accept that. We will continue to work for Palestine because we have the truth on our side. Once you have the truth on your side, trust me, trust me, the thief will always look behind him. They know that we are standing on a higher ground. We will continue to do that. I represent the American Muslims for Palestine, an organization that is, alhamdulillah, dedicated to continue to advance our narrative, to continue to expand our coalition here, the Movement for Palestine, the Solidarity Movement for Palestine, and that is, inshallah, dedicated to continue to bring Palestine to the center of the discussion. We will continue to provide information to counter the misinformation. We will continue to put forth the truth to counter the falsehoods. They can fabricate. They can fabricate. But they cannot convince people to accept their lies. The world is sending a message now. The international community that has for long and will continue to suppress the Palestinians' plight has sent a signal that even though we have been supporting you for decades now, but there is a limit for how much can we support you and for how long we can support you. The lie is getting bigger and bigger now. And the oppression is getting bigger and bigger now. So inshallah, we'll continue to work for our issue here, not only for Palestine, but for all of our issues. Remember, the United States not o is not only our homeland, it's not only our country, it is also a major player in all of these issues in the Middle East, the issues that relate to us in Syria, in Libya, in Yemen, in Palestine, in Iraq, and in Egypt. So we need to continue to do our part. Don't expect the Palestinians in Palestine or the Syrians in Syria to be lobbying and to be working for their causes here. It is our role to work for their causes and our causes here, not only because we belong or we have an, some sort of an attachment to that part of the world, but also because we love America and we want to have a better America for all. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.